Good evening, everyone. I'm all tangled up. How's everybody doing? Uh, excellent. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. My name is Jarrett Weisselman. I'm the editorial director for ET Online, and I am thrilled to be here tonight to lead a conversation with the amazing actress you guys just watched in Showtime's Masters of Sex. Ladies and gentlemen, give a big round of applause for Lizzie Kaplan. She brought you brought that all the way from home for no reason? No, I actually just brought it from upstairs. Am I allowed to <laughs> display it? Well, now you have one water and one vodka, so you're set. Don't tell oh, them. Sorry. sorry. How are you doing? All right. How are you guys doing? All right. Excellent. Um, I have to say, congratulations on the show. It's such a fantastic show. Your performance in it is just amazing, Lizzie. Thanks. Um, if you could, uh, let's go back to the beginning, I mean, not of life, but... Uh, Are you sure? You don't want to start there? Sure. There was a big bang. Okay. Tell me more. <laughs> That's actually all. That was that. it. Yeah. So, okay, so were you talking about the show or the universe? <laughs> oh, oh, nicely uh, played. Uh, all right, but in seriousness, guys. Uh, when, how did the script first come to you for Masters of Sex? Uh, in a very boring way. Uh, the usual channels. My agent sent it to me. But they were fairly positive that I would not want to have anything to do with the show, not because of what you just saw and what you would assume, <laughs> but uh, because I, I fancied myself a comedic actress and I had come to terms with the fact that that was going to be my life and I was kind of looking forward to that life. Like it's a nice life to be able to work in comedy and I think it's a very exciting time uh, in comedy, especially in television. And then I don't particularly love procedural shows. There's period pieces are not things that people think of me for. Uh, and I think, if I'm being really honest, I wasn't going after things that I didn't think I had a shot at getting. Um, and so they assumed that I just wouldn't want to do it. But I read it, and I loved it, and I was like, I may as well just fight for this. I'm never going to get the part. What about Virginia and the script made you want to fight for it? I think that there are elements of levity in this story that are so absurd. I mean, I think that the, <laughs> the best uh, dramas have really funny moments in them. Like, I think The Sopranos had some, some of the biggest laughs that I, I can even remember thinking of. And I think the best comedies have you know, real pathos to them, the ones that resonate the most deeply for me. So I'm always looking for something that sort of straddles the line, but again, I was looking mainly in comedy. Uh, so reading the script, there was stuff that was, I couldn't believe how strange the real story was. Like it was absurd and hilarious without even any joke happening, just because what, they're sitting in there watching, the, uh, okay, and as an actress, I'm gonna sit there watching this stuff go on in front of, it just, it made me laugh in a way that surprised me. I thought it would be terrifying uh, to do, which it definitely was every single day. And I don't know, uh, so there's something about Virginia. I felt like all of the, the parts that I had played, these sort of off-center female roles were preparing me for something like this. And I didn't realize it until I read it. How does one in this business go about fighting for a role the way you fought for this role? Um, I think that it's different for everybody and I've, I've tried to fight for roles in the past and it did not work for me. Like I've written impassioned letters to directors about why it should be me and I know it's a long shot but you should really listen to this letter and give me this part and it'll be a great story that we can tell her. Nope, never got any replies to any of those letters that I sent. Um, and for this, it was, I met with uh, John Madden, the director, and Michelle Ashford, who created the show, and Sarah Timmerman, who produced it. And I just wanted to sit with them and basically have three people listen to me tell them about why I related to this woman in 1956. Again, not thinking that anything would come of it ever. It was just like a weird exercise. I, more like I wanted to just have a conversation with the people who were behind this show because I loved this woman so much so instantly after reading the script. And so uh, I went and I, I met with them at the 
chateau and we drank a lot of martinis and got really drunk and I like told them sort of slutty stories about myself in order to win them over. <laughs> and then they asked if I would read because again, I, I'm very, I think I give off of a, more of a contemporary vibe than a, than a period vibe. And I said, okay, I'll read for you guys one time. Like, just like absurdly confident. Like, yeah, okay, I'll do it one time and you guys can make your decision, people. <laughs> I had no business, like, eat. And so they, I did a full hair and makeup test. It was just uh, John Madden and myself. And it was like a three and a half hour long audition. And we read everything multiple times. And I walked away from that audition being like, that was one of the more amazing experiences I've had as an actress working with this intensely wonderful, kind, prolific director, and I'm never getting that part. Not a chance. And then a couple days later, he called me, John called me to congratulate me on getting the part, and it was the first time in so many years that I was legitimately excited. Like, you get so jaded so quickly. Um, do, you, do you ever watch that show, Unscripted, mm -hmm. that HBO show? Um, there's this moment in that show where the guy, like Brian Greenberg, the actor, like he gets this role and he buys drinks for everybody in the bar. And that's an experience that I think you don't get to have after a certain number of successes. It's like a good problem to have, like, oh, I don't want to buy drinks for the people in the bar. But it was... I wanted to buy drinks for the people in the bar. I was really excited. And I said to him, okay, do I get to go celebrate this now? Because I haven't wanted to celebrate in a long time. And he was like, just wait, let's close the deal with the other actor. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, okay. And then expecting you know, maybe two days and the other actor is not Michael Sheen. And this process went on for months and months and months through pilot season where I was getting opportunities to do Pilots. I mean, this at, at that point was an idea of a show that may or may not happen, and they were having issues with casting. And so, m much to the chagrin of my agents and managers for another pilot season, I was like, nope, nope, not interested in that actual tangible job with like money and <laughs> any sort of security. <laughs> nope, I'm going to stick with this idea, this like pipe dream that's probably not going to happen and miraculously it worked out. I mean, most of the time when I do stupid stuff like that, like, no, I don't need that job. Uh, it doesn't work <laughs> out in my favor. And for some reason this one did. I mean, and it, I think it worked out m even more beautifully than it could have ever. I mean, Michael Sheen, it's, there's nobody else who should be playing this role. And honestly, if the casting process didn't take so long, then he, I mean, he was unavailable when it first started, when it first came around. So very, very long story short, um, when I was walking through the halls of like, <laughs> C my agent was at CAA at the time and the show, like it worked out and every we were gonna shoot it. And I walked down the hallway and I really expected like a slow clap. <laughs> like every like, you were right. You were right for sticking this out for months and months. No, nothing, nothing. <laughs> You said that when you were filming it, there was a lot of nervous energy that you had sort of every day working on the show. How much time passed before that nervous energy sunk in? Like how much time did you get to celebrate? And then were you like, okay, now it's time to get cracking on the show? Uh, it took a long time. We shot the pilot. It was really luxurious for like a month or something in New York. Um, and so I was nervous every, every day of the pilot and probably the first episode and a half, I was just petrified when we started shooting the series. And then, like any other job, you just becomes your life yeah. and you get used to it. And the, you know, there's always stuff that's sort of scary about it, but showing up ceased to be the scariest part. <laughs> how, how much of a factor was the fact that you were playing someone who, at the time, was alive and had done all of this? I mean, how much pressure is there when you're playing a real person? There's a lot of pressure to, I mean, yeah, it feels like, oh, somebody's actually <laughs> really going to be watching with a, a different kind of eye than just an audience member because it's her life that we're talking about. And it's, I mean, I was very intimidated by that prospect. 
And then she passed away before the show aired, which is so, I mean, like within, I think it was like two months or something before the show aired. But she was a very private person. She didn't want to meet. She didn't want to have a relationship uh, with me or really anybody involved with the show. And so on the one hand, it was, I, I felt this responsibility to this woman who I'd never met. And I also thought if I did a really good job, then maybe she would want to be best <laughs> friends. <laughs> I got this <laughs> this fantasy that I would go to Missouri and we would just we would just hang out and just talk about life and she would you know really bestow all of her wisdom on me and unfortunately uh, we didn't get that opportunity but yes I think that it's it's a daunting task to play a real person especially when you're starring opposite like the grand master of playing real people and which he will point <laughs> he will point out. <laughs> Um, but because Virginia Johnson, I mean, even if you had researched uh, Masters and Johnson or learned about them in school, it's not like playing Jackie O. It doesn't right. conjure up this very specific image of a woman, how she spoke, how she walked, how, uh, none of that. So I got to, I, I felt like I had a lot of wiggle room in order to interpret her like in the way I saw fit because it wasn't a direct impersonation. It was, you know, how I chose to see her. Well, with that said, I mean, what was important to you about building ver your version of Virginia when you came, when time came? Well, I mean, I guess that's sort of a complicated question. There was, there was lots of it. I chose to hold on tightly to the stuff that I saw, uh, similarities between the two of us versus differences. Um, and there were a lot. I mean, small things and some bigger things as well. But, I mean, in the book they talk a lot about she's a singer, and so she had this very melodic way of speaking. And I knew that that would ring false if I tried to do that. Um, and But I've been told my whole life that my voice is unique, <laughs> which is, I mean, a nicer way to say it. Like, I've, people always used to make fun of me for my voice, and so that was something like, okay, I'm going to go with that. Now, now we both have weird voices, but <laughs> mine's not melodic. Um, and it really, like, I was so fixated because I felt so out of my comfort zone. Um, for the first time, I had to pay attention to things like my posture and not shortening words or padding lines with like, you know, uhs and ums and slouching and all of these things that I really thought were like the tools that made me this good actress when I realized it, they were more crutches in order to make a line seem believable. And this is like, they, they stripped that all away. And so in, in a way it's been a very interesting experience because now I can channel whatever I was wasting my energy on before into like the beautifully written scripts you know they didn't require me to do my normal spin on things plus nobody was interested <laughs> interested in that um i mean it strikes me though that there had to have been a lot of i feel like you might be underselling the sheer volume of work you had to put into this because it's not only the physicality and the era specific voice and the way of delivery but i mean it's also this entire jargon you have to absorb and her motivation of a woman who although there is a wonderful contemporary feel to the show. I mean, it is, you know, a period piece. Um, for you, I mean, was it important that the show have both a modernity and sort of an old timeliness? Well, I think just the character, uh, she's seen as a modern woman, whereas that, we can take that as a compliment now, you know, just talking about somebody in the 50s being ahead of her time, whereas being ahead of your time is a truly lonesome, isolating place to be. Uh, I don't think many people would want to be ahead of their time. And so the work, I mean, the actual acting work, having to be word perfect in scripts, having to, you know, it wasn't one of those jobs where I rapped and then I went out like drinking with my friends for hours. It was like, no, I went home and I worked really hard and we all did. and. I think uh, being surrounded by actors who were more serious actors instead of just like comedic jerk offs <laughs> where like <laughs> it's just as important to be funny behind the monitors at Video Village and like make your friends laugh than it is to be funny on in, like that weird yeah. competition which like, oh, listen, I, I love that and I, I love comedy people but it felt different, it felt more serious. Um, and I, I was excited to have the opportunity to take things more seriously. But, so she's this, this modern woman in this 
time. She didn't have a lot of allies, uh, especially not other women. And that's one of the things I loved the most about her. And one of the things I grabbed onto really tightly is that she kept looking around to like nudge other women, like, can you believe this? And there was like nobody there. You know, they were the ones questioning her more than anything else. So I think as an actor, it's especially a part like this where she had to compartmentalize so much mm -hmm. of her life in order to get up in the morning, in order to not, if she thought too deeply about anything, it might give her some serious pause. I mean, you just saw in this episode, she's friends with this man's wife mm -hmm. and they remain friends for years and years and years while this is all going on. And so there was something about the period that lent to this idea of like, keep your head down and just keep moving forward in your life. It, this was not a time, we have some therapy scenes, but they're sort of, they're funny because of how rare it was. I mean, I, I, I live in a time now and in a city and surrounded by people where every, everything is overly analyzed. Every thought, every feeling I have, every experience I've had, I've picked apart in therapy for hours and hours and hours. So I had to get rid of all of that and just figure out a way to be believable in a part where she wasn't thinking too deeply about anything. Because if she did start thinking too deeply about anything, it would be her downfall. And for somebody who, who's very smart, being forced to not think too deeply about stuff, I found that interesting. For you, as the actor bringing that to life, there obviously has to be a lot of thought that you're personally putting into it. I mean, what is your, whether it's across the board or specific to this project, what is sort of your process on a daily basis when you're bringing someone to life in terms of I think a lot of my characters do stuff that's at times questionable and hurts other characters' feelings. They're messy, complicated women uh, for the most part, if not all of the time. And I think you're, job as an actor is to find out why why this person would do what she's doing and to try not to judge these actions in any sort of way because people don't set out to do evil unless you're making that movie about that guy who sets out to do evil <laughs> people are doing the best that they can and for the most part everybody can justify their own actions and she does some very questionable stuff and so it's like how do i figure out a way to make these actions justifiable. And the truth is, I mean, I think they were justified. What these two people did changed the world, yeah. and especially for women, but they left in their wake a lot of broken hearts and a lot of really dysfunctional relationships. Obviously, one of the huge functions of this show, as you can tell from the title, is the sex that comes along with it. What sex? Sorry, we're not familiar. Yeah. What happened to your hand? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you someone who is comfortable with sex scenes in general? You know, I hear stories about actors who do these like fairly explicit sex scenes, and then you find out like, oh no, she's really prude, and like she. I don't see. Am I comfortable with it? Yes. I mean, I had, I had to be comfortable with it to a certain degree in order to even walk through the door or like swing the bat at this at all. Otherwise, it would just be, I mean, what would I be doing there? And also like to do justice to the legacy of this woman. I mean, if I was going to be squeamish about this stuff, then I felt like I had no right even trying to get the gig. So much of who she was was being comfortable in her own skin and comfortable with her own sexuality. I was just listening to... Uh, an interview with her and, and Tom Mayer, who wrote the book that the show is based on. And it's just crazy. I, I, just today I heard that he said, or she was talking about how Masters was telling her how there's, how actually it's going to be a sex study and not this infertility. Like the work is not going to be about infertility. It's going to be a sex study. And her reaction is, but why would you need to study sex? Like, sex works just fine. Like it never crossed her mind that like anybody had any inadequacies or it wasn't going great for anybody. She's like, well sex is, what, what do you mean? And I, I felt like I had to go in with that mindset as the actor. And of course it's like shooting a sex scene is uncomfortable and strange and weird and the best I can do is find the humor in it because it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and if I didn't, love my co-star. I think that would make it extra hard. I mean, if we couldn't joke about how ridiculous... Because it's... There are shooting sex scenes 
which I've done a few times with nudity, and but it's intimate and there's kissing and you can like the lighting is great and you can really just like it's sort of fun and in a weird, strange way. And this was like there's no intimacy. It's the, clinical. Yeah, yeah, it's just like parts <laughs> in parts. The and harshest of lighting. The, the, not great. And the the wires like. You just had to get used to kind of being covered in, because if, if we put robes on and if we were super modest, then that's an extra 20 minutes every single take right. because those wires would pop off. If you, any sweating, the wires popped off. So not only was it Michael and I and like the skeleton crew, but we had all these nurses that were in there to do the thing. And it's, just, it's absurd. Like these sex scenes are, are so strange that I think you just, I mean, I just had to embrace them. <laughs> but I mean, it probably also helps that A, it's in service of amazing material, and B, everyone's kind of in the same boat. It's not like yeah. you and Caitlin are the only ones doing sex scenes. Right. I mean, the guys are just as much, if not more, naked. It yeah. seems like there had to be a lot of camaraderie that was born out of that. For sure. And, you know, it, it's like this expectation now with premium cable shows that if you're paying for your cable subscription, then you're going to see some breasts. <laughs> a bouncing or whatever <laughs> but like all these shows are about other things right. and then you know michelle ashford she she talks about it and like the, the they let's pause the story and watch two people pretend to have sex with each other for a couple minutes and then we'll get back to the story like that's not what this is the, the sex is the story and for the most part we're not showing these like romanticized like idealized beautiful sex scenes like it's awkward and uncomfortable and I think that one of the things I'm the most proud of in this show is that it didn't take us long how to figure out how to do that in a way that worked like the and people picked up on it I thought for sure we'd have to deal with like a half season of reviewers being like talking about how it's exploiting women and, and just missing the mark but people get it pretty quickly that this is kind of a feminist story and it's the it none of it is exploiting women like I never felt that not for a second uh, and then you know there are the people who come on to the show and they don't have any lines they're just in a masturbation montage <laughs> like that's harder than me being there with all my buddies on the crew who you know I can yell at and they get me sandwiches and stuff like <laughs> it's a way better situation and those people can show up and be brave enough to do that without knowing anybody's name I can, you know, put my blinders on and just get it done. <laughs> <laughs> From an acting perspective, what was the biggest obstacle you faced with this show? Um, in a later episode, I have to sing, uh, which I'm... <laughs> I, it actually ended up being something really awesome, but it's a strange thing where, you know, I, my life is doing things in front of people I'm, I mean like acting you're in, you're putting yourself out there and when somebody says sing I totally freeze up it's sca it scares me so much I have terrible stage fright I have to be about to be hospitalized in order to get up on stage to sing karaoke like a just a bottle of booze before it even crosses my mind to like get up there I'm so nervous about it and you know I I I did it. I forced them to get me <laughs> singing lessons, but I didn't know when I walked into the singing lesson if she was going to be like, oh, no, we need a voice double. You can't sing at all. Or if she was going to be like, you can, you can do this. You can do this. And that's what she ended up uh, saying, and it was one of the more fulfilling things I had to do because I, I think as an actor, one of the most fun things we get to do is the stuff that truly scares us. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to get lazy with that. But why not do the stuff that's really scary? And now Lizzie will sing for us. <clears throat> I would never, never. do that. I, um, I would never do that either. <laughs> but it, <laughs> but it, it brings me up an interesting question. And this was something we actually got a lot from the audience tonight. Um, did you have to do sort of any dialect work to get that era specific tone or any elocution classes prior to filming? No, I just tried to stop slurring my words <laughs> like a lazy mouthed, lazy person. Uh, no, I, I think that it's really easy to get sucked into, especially doing this era, like that, that kind of. Right. Um, so, uh, like, 
<laughs> Catherine Hepburn got upset. <laughs> and nobody wants to see that. Uh, the truth is, they talked like that in movies. I have to imagine they spoke like we all speak, with you know, slightly different slang. So I was really fixated on it when I first started, and yet when I watch it now, it's like in my mind it felt much more heightened than what actually is showing up on screen, which I'm pretty relieved about because I thought maybe it would be that like old timey thing. Yeah. Uh, but no, I didn't. I didn't do any of that. I just. It was really easy to become this person, like to want to live in the skin of this person. And the good news is we meet her when she's new to this environment. And so I did think that she wouldn't, you know, she's a, she's a nightclub singer. She comes from a different world than the people that you meet in the pilot and that you, you, we live with in this show. And so I thought that it would actually work to my advantage to be a little unsure how to sit and a little unsure how to speak because now I'm around uh, academics and serious people. And so it sort of matched up with uh, what I was dealing with as an actress. Um, you sort of spoke to this already, but another uh, audience question we had is, as an actor, how do you approach something like Masters of Sex differently than something like Party Down or a lot of the comedic roles you were talking about? Uh, they're, they're just, it's so different. Um, I think also if somebody had done only drama and was going to do comedy, it would be equally as scary. It's just, it's just the newness of it and I'm very comfortable in comedy, only because I've just done it more. So, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's, I don't really know, I don't really know. Do, do you have formal training? Because, I mean, you're improv with like some of the best improvisers in the business at times in your comedy work. Yes, uh, and I think that if you're around amazing improvers, you get better at, mm. at improv -ing. I think anything else, it's, it's like this, Brokering your self-confidence. It, it doesn't matter if you're doing drama or if you're doing comedy. It all comes from like how confident you are. It was much more apparent. Uh, I, I guess I was just paying more attention to it uh, in comedy because I realized, oh, I'm way funnier if I like the people that I'm with. And if they are treating me like an equal instead of not, uh, you know, like, because it's true, I work with people who are professionally trained improv actors and I don't have that training and the people who you sense that oh, what is this girl doing here it just like freezes you up whereas if people respect you and it builds your confidence and then you can be funnier like I was on the phone with my agent the other day and I realized that I was telling him like your job is to make me feel good about myself. <laughs> like, I don't want to hear negative feedback because I need to walk into those rooms and feel like I'm hot shit. Otherwise, I'm not going to get the part. And I think that, like, certain actors are, like, I know uh, some of my actor friends, they want to hear, like, everything. They want to hear, like, oh, you weren't cute enough or funny enough or all that. Like, I don't want to hear any of that. I want everybody to be thinking, like, <laughs> or I want to be thinking that everybody just thinks I'm amazing. <laughs> or else, like, I can't, I can't, I don't stand a chance. Yeah. Um, and actually doing, like, acting classes, I have very little uh, training, which I'm pretty embarrassed about. Because um, I, I didn't end up going to, I deferred <laughs> my admission to acting school and just never went. And I did, like, these acting classes in the valley when all my friends were in college and I was really into it and I, I never really understood why I was listening to this woman who was very hard on me and like who who was this woman to tell me what to do? You're teaching an acting class in the valley. Like why do you know <laughs> better than I do? You know, and I found like the whole process of like of acting class really confusing because you're doing, you know, like movie scenes, but you're on a stage. So like what kind of acting are we supposed to actually be doing here? And then they would get mad when you missed rehearsal because you had an audition. It's like, what is the purpose <laughs> of all of this? And I think that it's, I mean, if it is a business of like brokering your own confidence, I think a lot of these acting schools and stuff, they, these teachers sort of, they like being in the power position and sometimes that means that they kind of break you down mm -hmm. when it's the opposite of what people need to do the best job.
Um, so quit acting school forever. <laughs> 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 well, let me ask. Um, I'm assuming, based on what you just said, you're not an actor who reads reviews or watches themselves. Uh, I wish that that were true. That's something I'm still <laughs> learning. Um, it, this is this has been the first thing in a really long time that I'm highly uncomfortable watching, and I I do watch it in like every week. I haven't, you know, I'm I've just seen that one, but I'm watching them in real time for the most part, and. It's another thing, like in comedy, I got really used to watching myself do my thing, yeah. that I could be somewhat objective about it, and now I'm like back to square one, like 16 years old, like, why does my face move like that? <laughs> like all that stuff that you sort of move past uh, is hitting me again for the first time. And yeah, I read the reviews like a crazy person, and I, it's a bad idea. <laughs> and the reviews are good for this show. Like, kind of amazingly good, which is why I read them at all, because as soon as they're bad, I stop reading them. But it's, somebody told me, you know, if you believe the good ones, you have to believe the bad ones. And, because there was a period of time where I wanted to tell my agents or whatever, like, just send me the good, <laughs> just send me the good ones, for all the reasons that I said before, but I think it's really easy for me, and I think that this m applies to uh, definitely other actors that I know, that you don't realize it's happening, but your self-worth gets so quickly braided in with everything else. And especially in the internet age, you know, people are writing before they even have a minute to think about it. I mean, there are reviews of our show up within an hour of it airing. Nobody takes the time to digest it. And especially cable television, I mean, it's supposed to be seen as like a 12-hour movie. Mm -hmm. And if you cut into it too deeply, these chunks that you see every week, it, I think it kind of ruins the experience for the viewer, but you know, everybody has a job to do and bloggers and critics have to fill up uh, inches on a page and I understand that. And I'm, I feel fortunate because people are nice to our show and people are pretty much picking up what we're putting down in the way that we intended. Mm -hmm. But it's embarrassing to admit, but you know, I, I read a lot of reviews, and if I feel like people aren't liking certain things that I liked, it, it makes me feel bad. And I think the solution, which Michelle Ashford, who created the show, just yelled at me over email today about, was just stop reading the reviews. <laughs> like, live your life, do your job, do the best job you can, and like, fuck the rest of it. It's such, go it's so, it's so not good for a person. Right. I'm um, curious, this is a unique experience in this way because it's based on a real story. So you know, you know, the points along the way that you guys are going to hit. But with your other television shows that you've done, it's been an original series. Do you enjoy sort of that open-ended journey more than a film where you necessarily can read page one to page 120 and know where she's going? Yeah, I definitely do. I think I might actually, I mean, getting to do both is the dream and it's, that's nice, uh, but I, I love television. Working on a movie for months at a time by like week six, you're like, right, oh, we're doing this scene in the movie through the script I've read a thousand times. Like, and it's a totally different experience. I don't have as much experience in film as I do in television. And so maybe I just have a soft spot for it. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, like when I first, started television I only saw it as like a jumping off point to get into the film business I don't think that I mean I don't feel that way anymore and I think most people don't feel that way anymore it's impossible to say that the films that people are making right now are better than the television people are making right now and I, I think I'm just impatient and so I like new stories I like it, to me, it's better for me as an actress to not have too much time to obsess over certain scenes, which in a movie I do. Like the, the difficult ones, the ones that I'm nervous about doing, I'll stress out about them for weeks and weeks. And I don't think that that helps my performance. TV, the pace is so fast that you just have to, you know, you get warmed up within the first two or three weeks, I, I, I feel like I did, and then you're just like this machine that can do, that can learn monologues in five minutes and like just crazy <laughs> stuff that it's, I think it's a really interesting exercise for actors to do TV, just because it, it's, 
it's so different than I think what we're trained to do in a way. And yeah, uh, but also just like when you love the character that you're playing and you get to see this character in totally new situations every two weeks, it's legitimately exciting. Like I, I would be excited to get every script on this show and I know what's going to happen. And it's one of those rare things where it's like anybody can read the Wikipedia page and know the trajectory of these two people and it's still compelling, I think, how we get them where they're going to end up. Absolutely. In talking about, you know, your initial intent, television to film, do you remember the first time you consciously wanted to act? I sort of fell into it in a weird way and I just knew that I didn't want to play the piano, so. <laughs> Were those I the would, only two options? Yeah, at okay. that point, <laughs> I had to pick between the two. No, I went to a performing arts high school in LA and I was a piano player for like 10 years and I never wanted to be a pianist and it was like at the point where I had to either be a pianist or n like not be in the performing arts program anymore and so I decided to be an actor because I thought I could fake it for two years. Um, and stay in the program because I liked my English teacher and he was like, like really dumb reasons. But no, I didn't, uh, I didn't have that feeling at all beforehand. And then my f drama one class was ridiculous. <laughs> and I remember getting up there for the first time and being so nervous. And then as soon as I started doing like what, I, it was like a commercial or something for glue. I don't, re I don't remember what, I just remember eating glue. I thought that would be a real funny, hilarious thing to do. And then, I mean, it was, it was stupid, but it was like getting on stage and that was it. It was like me and this audience of like really jaded, unhappy 10th graders. And I was just trying to make them laugh or entertain them in any sort of way. And it was this weird thing that's like, oh, I've never thought about doing this before. And yet I find myself here and I as soon as that happened, like the, within months, I was like, oh no, I'm, this is all I ever want to do. Um, and I'm going to go on auditions and I'm going to get the lead in a movie my first time out of the gate <laughs> because I'm clearly a, like horrible, <laughs> like the, the way that we delude ourselves, I think, to do this at all. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I, w I think because I wasn't, I didn't grow up dreaming of being an actress, like I had to, learn all these lessons while I was technically already trying to be an actress. And so the business, I think, is it, it knocks you down in the way that it needs to knock you down. To, so you can, you have to prove to yourself that there's like, I had to prove to myself that there was nothing else I could do, mm -hmm. uh, that I had no other options. And I think had I, you know, gotten that lead in that first movie, I would have, it would not have worked for me. It's a very long-winded answer, and I don't think I actually did answer no, what you, you asked. But you lead me into my next question, which is, what do you feel is the best lesson you've learned professionally as an actor? Or as a pianist? <laughs> as a pianist, I, <laughs> I was the worst pianist. Um, You'd think you would have been good after 10 years. No, I, just, I was like, like I just proficient, save. Okay. Uh, but I had, no, I had no passion. Got it. All right. Do you know? <laughs> um, I think the best thing that I've learned, the most important lesson that I personally have learned is it's a very special job, a very special job to have such a variation every single day of what you get to do and to be creatively fulfilled and, and frightened and challenged. But at the end of the day, it's a job and it's a part of your bigger life. And if you're not cultivating a bigger life, you're going to inevitably be, get worse and worse at that job. That makes sense. I don't know if this would fall in, but lastly, what is the best piece of advice you've been given, either by another actor or a director that you would like to pass on to this room of actors and maybe directors? Take Fountain. <laughs> <laughs> It is invaluable. Well, listen, Lizzie, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you to Showtime and the Screen Actors Guild. And have a lovely evening.